The Mystery Girl, Chapter 1 Quite aside from its natural characteristics, there is an atmosphere about a college town, especially a New England college town, that is unmistakable. It is not so much actively intellectual as passively aware of and satisfied with its own intellectuality. The beautiful little town of Corinth was no exception, from its tree-shaded village green to the white-columned homes on its outskirts it fairly radiated a satisfied sense of its own superiority. Not that the people were smug or self-conceited. They merely accepted the fact that the University of Corinth was among the best in the country and that all true Corinthians were both proud and worthy of it. The village itself was a gem of well-kept streets, roads, and houses, and all New England could scarce show a better groomed settlement. In a way, the students, of course, owned the place, yet there were many families whose claim to prominence lay in another direction. However, Corinth was by all counts a college town and gloried in it. The university had just passed through the throes and thrills of one of its own presidential elections. The contest of the candidates had been long, and at last the strife had become bitter. Two factions strove for supremacy. One, the conservative side, adhering to old traditions, the other, the modern spirit, preferring new conditions and progressive enterprise, hard-waged and hard-won, the battle had resulted at last in the election of John Waring, the candidate of the followers of the old school. Waring was not an old fogey, nor yet a hidebound or narrow-minded back number. But he did put mental attainment ahead of physical prowess, and he did hold by certain old-fashioned principles and methods, which he and his constituents felt to be the backbone of the old and honored institution. Wherefore, though his election was an accomplished fact, John Waring had made enemies that seemed likely never to be placated. 11. But Waring's innate serenity and acquired poise were not. Disturbed by adverse criticism, he was a man with an eye single to his duty as he saw it and he accepted the position of responsibility and trust, simply and sincerely with a determination to make his name honored among the list of presidents. Inauguration, however, would not take place until June, and the months from February on would give him time to accustom himself to his new duties, and to learn much from the retiring president. Yet it must not be thought that John Waring was unpopular. On the contrary, he was respected and liked by everybody in Corinth. Even the rival faction conceded his ability, his sterling character, and his personal charm. And their chagrin and disappointment at his election was far more because of their desire for the other candidates' innovations than of any dislike for John Waring as a man. Of course, there were some who candidly expressed 
their disapproval of the new president, but, so far, no real opposition was made, and it was hoped there would be none. 12. Now, whether because of the exigencies of his new position, or merely because of the irresistible charms of Mrs. Bates, Waring expected to make the lady his wife before his inauguration, and a good thing, his neighbor, Mrs. Adams, observed. John Waring ought to be been somebody's good-looking husband long ago, but a bachelor president of Corinth is out of all reason. Who'd stand by his side at the receptions, I'd like to know. For certain public receptions were dearly loved by the citizens of Corinth, and Mrs. Adams was one of the most reception-loving of all. As in all college towns, there were various and sundry boarding houses, inns, and hotels of all grades, but the boarding house of Mrs. Adams was, without a dissenting voice, acclaimed the most desirable and most homelike. The good lady's husband, though known as Old Salt, was by no means a seafaring man, nor had he ever been. Instead, he was a leaf on a branch of the Saltonstall family tree, and the irreverent abbreviation had been given him long ago, and had stuck. Yes, indeed, Mrs. Adams asserted, We've never had a bachelor president of Corinth, and I hope we never will. Mrs. Bates is a nice, sweet-spoken lady, a widow of four years. Standing, and I do say she's just the one for Dr. Waring's wife. She has dignity and yet she's mighty human. Emily Bates was human. Not very tall, a little inclined to plumpness, with fair hair and laughing blue eyes. She was of a cozy, home-loving sort and her innate good nature and ready tact were unfailing. At first, she had resisted John Waring's appeal, but he persisted until she found she really liked the big, wholesome man, and without much difficulty learned to love him. Waring was distinguished-looking rather than handsome. Tall and well-made, he had a decided air of reserve, which he rarely broke through, but which Emily Bates discovered. Could give way to confidences showing depths of sweetness and charm. The two were happily matched. Waring was forty-two and Mrs. Bates half a dozen years younger. But both seemed younger than their years and retained their earlier tastes and enthusiasms. Also both were bound up, heart and soul in the welfare of the university. Mrs. Bates' first husband had been one of its 
Prominent professors and its history and traditions were known and loved by the cheery little lady. Perhaps the only person in Corinth who was not pleased at the approaching nuptials of John Waring and Emily Bates was Mrs. Peyton, Waring's present housekeeper. For it meant the loss of her position, which she had faithfully filled for ten years or more. And this meant the loss of a good and satisfactory home, not only for herself, but for her daughter Helen, a girl of eighteen, who lived there also. Not yet had Waring told his housekeeper that she was to be dethroned, but she knew the notice would come, knew, too that it was delayed only because of John Waring's disinclination to say or do anything unwelcome to another. And Mrs. Peyton had been his sister's school friend and had served him well and faithfully. Yet she must go for the incoming mistress needed no other housekeeper for the establishment than her own efficient, capable self. It was a very cold February afternoon, and Mrs. Peyton was serving tea in the cheerful living room. Emily Bates was present, an indulgence she seldom allowed herself, for she,